Okay. Um, well, let's bring this meeting to order. It's the September 1st, 2020, New Report Conservation Commission meeting uh, taking place on the Zoom platform. And uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, first item, our approval of the August 18th, 2020 minutes. Um, we have any comments or changes or something? Motion to approve. Second. All right, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Rhonda Cola. Yes. And I vote yes. Um, next item uh, are the Long Island updates. Do we have any updates um, on? Just that the, I think I mentioned at the last meeting that they were hoping to hold an MRBA meeting again soon, and they have one scheduled for um, September 11th, which is next, a week from this Friday at 11 a.m., and it'll be remote. I can send you all the, um, the link to that. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, any motion on the uh, placing of the bags? No, they're still revising the plans. Um, and trying to finalize it. They've got two options and right now it just comes down to a matter of, of cost. And they've worked out the logistics, I think of how they're gonna do it because they found a contractor who can do it, but they need to figure out how much each um, option will cost and what they have to spend. And that will dictate whether it's two bags high or one bag high. Um, so that's just being worked out right now. And, and when DEP I get a final okay. plan, I'll email you. DEP is okay with it? DEP is okay with it. They're the ones um, who Donna and um, DPS and GZA were in conversations with them just to come up with a solution that DEP would approve of. So yeah, they have um, given us the okay for this particular sandbag system, at least as a temporary measure. It has to be considered temporary, I guess. So okay. if um, the dredging of the harbor funds might be available sometime next year, which means it wouldn't happen till 2022, perhaps. Yeah. I can see this temporary emergency thing happening several more times. Yeah. And I just wonder how much more money we're going to throw down in the sand pail. Um, before well. Somebody starts thinking about buying the houses. And yeah, well, Steve, I would just, I would encourage you, those are great questions. Um, I would encourage you to join in on the MRBA meeting on next week, um, because that's the kind of thing that gets discussed at each of these MRBA meetings is things like the timeline for the dredging and what it's going to take to get that done. And can we push it up and how much is it going to cost and permitting and those types of things. Um, and, and all the political issues that go along with that come up at the, these MRBA meetings. So it's a good place to um, hear everyone's perspectives, but also to ask, ask those kinds of questions. Okay, yeah, send the information and I'll, I'll try and be there. Okay. Yeah, um, and they better get a move on because I know there, there's four systems in the Atlantic now. Two of them aren't gonna hit us, but there's two, uh, two around Africa or in the middle of the Atlantic, one off of Africa that we don't know where it's going, so. Hmm. And there's probably a lot more to come. Um, okay. Um, so next time, let's move on to uh, certificates of compliance, request for determinations, et cetera. Uh, first item is uh, Ross Solomon, 39 Reservation Terrace, request for a certificate of compliance. Okay, so on this one, we have Tom Hughes is raising his hand. Tom, I'm gonna allow you to talk and I wanna just remind everybody who is um, maybe here as an abutter or as a member of the public to ask questions that if you, when you have a question, raise your hand and we will try to call on you at the end of the uh, discussion, at the end of the meeting on this topic. Okay, good evening. Um, those of you who've been on the commission for a while may remember this project. This was the one where we started by permitting, um, taking an existing cottage that had an awful lot of sentimental value to the applicant. And we were proposing to move it back on the lot 
um, put in a pile foundation, lift it up and put it back on and then add a second floor and do some major renovations. And then mm -hmm. we ended up changing into a much more simple tear down rebuild. Um, the uh, Mr. Solomon who did this and, and uh, enjoyed the cottage for several years is taking care of all the vegetative planting, all the things that were required. And um, I met Julia on site to review the, the area. There was some knotweed that had come in along the side of the, the building and that um, we had pulled uh, after filing. So that's been taken care of and I provided a picture to Julia on that. And um, the site is really nicely vegetated and, and uh, the pictures that you see don't really do it justice, but it, it really is uh, doing quite well and uh, really happy with how it came out. So I don't know, Julia, if you want to add anything to that, but you know. Yeah, um, oh yeah, we had a site visit. It does look good out there. Um, it is well vegetated. The American beach grass is healthy and looks good most of the way around the whole site. Um, as I mentioned to the commission in my notes, um, the we looked at the elevations all around the structure and it's two feet around at least in every location. There was one spot underneath the garage where one of the pilings looked like it was had less than two feet of clearance. Um, but we realized that was because they had mounded up the um, the P stone under the garage in that location, you know, and so it was just not leveled out. They put a lot of P stone under there and there's sort of a pile of it up against one of the pilings that when you measured them from the lowest horizontal, remember it was less than two feet. It really just needed to be um, that, that P stone needed to be spread out and then it solved the problem. I'm just going to try to share with you um, uh, some photos. Let me um, see. I can get that just a sec for you. Um, here we go. Can you guys see this picture? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's the bottom of the structure around on one side. Here's another spot. You can see the beach grass um, around in front and on the sides there. Um, this is underneath the structure in the parking area. This is the P-stone that they have spread around under there. Um, but there's good clearance underneath the entire structure. Here's a, here's a picture from farther away so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, they did a good job. It looks good. And there was some Japanese knotweed along this left side of the garage that was still in place. And um, Tom and I talked about having them remove that Japanese knotweed in this location and a couple other locations as well. And they've already done that. Um, so they got that invasive species out and now the dune grass should be able to move in closer to the building. Right, actually there was dune grass in and around that knotweed. So, and, and the dune grass is growing in a pathway that was um, installed along the left-hand side of the structure. Mr. Solomon just didn't use that pathway very much. So the, there's dune grass growing, not just where it's supposed to be, but even in the, the pathways, so. Okay. Any other questions? No. All right. Got a motion? Uh, motion to issue a certificate of compliance. Second. All right, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the ex next item is uh, the reserve at Bashaw Farm LLC, three to seven Colby Farm Lane, request for minor modification. Okay. Um, is there anyone here? Maybe Lisa Mead. Okay, let's see. Lisa, I sh you should be able to speak now. Thank you. Yes. I, was talking, I was talking to myself. Um, thank you, uh, Julia and uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lisa Mead, Mead Taylor and Costa, 30 Green Street, on behalf of Bashaw, the Reserve at Bashaw Farm LLC. And for the new members, this is the uh, new subdivision that's going in off of Colby Farm Lane on the left um, as you go down Colby Farm Lane. And this request has to do essentially with the last lot um, in that subdivision on the left. 
Um, and the first plan that we have here is the plan that was approved uh, for this lot. And you'll see that the driveway is on the left-hand side of this house. Um, and if you go to the next page, Julia, um, the proposal is merely to move the driveway to the right-hand side of the house. Um, the reason is, is that in lot 14, which is right next door, they want to put a deck um, and a porch. And so the driveway would be right next to it. Um, tight lots. Uh, so you'll see that the uh, the deck that had been proposed um, or the porch that had been proposed patio on the right side is now removed and you just have the entrance to the house and uh, the driveway. Um, what you can also see is it stays outside the 25 foot uh, wetland buffer which you can see there. Um, and so everything else stays intact. Now of course there's also the gravel footpath so it's not like there's no that, that there's not any construction that's happening. We're constructing that gravel footpath that goes in there as well. So the request is to flip the driveway on this particular lot. Um, and we're before the planning board tomorrow night to ask for the same request for them to modify their plans. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? Motions. Motion to approve the minor modification. Second. Paul Ely. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Is that a yes, Ron? Yes. Okay. And I vote. Can you hear me? Can hear you now. Thank um, you very much, Lisa. Before we go on, sure. On the on the um, the development across the street. Yes. The, those two trailers that were on someone else's property, did they get removed? Or. Um, I, Steve, I haven't been out there um, in a couple of weeks. At the closing that we did just about a month ago. Um, almost everything was gone except for, I think, one trailer and the requirement was to have it gone as well, I think by now, now that it's the first of the month. Um, but I'll tell you what, next time I see you guys, I'll update you on the status of the trailers. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, uh, next item uh, is Walter B. Long, 265 Water Street, request for determination of applicability. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, um, can you hear me? Go ahead, Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, okay. All right. So 265 Water Street. Um, you may remember the long permitting time we had on the neighboring property, which is the historic one with the brick on one side and the, the uh, clabberts on the other and, and shakes at the end. Um, this is the neighboring house. It, um, it basically the the applicant would like to reskin the house. It's going to be new siding and redoing the roof on the front. I also sent in some information just for for, for full disclosure. The um, the longer term plan includes a second phase, which includes um, cutting into the back roof and putting in a roof deck. Um, we didn't want to complicate this RDA because they'd like to get moving on the roof work and on the um, the reskinning of the house, and also the RDA would include new deck boards on the uh, on the deck on the rear. Um, there's no disturbance on the ground, um, so you can see the deck is in kind of rough shape. This deck, you may remember seeing it from the adjacent site. It actually goes from the rear of the house right out to the edge of the seawall. You can see, kind of see the seawall on the right. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's tight, but there'll be no disturbance on the ground as part of this project. And it's simply just a facelift on the house, some, some new windows, new siding, um, and, uh, and roof work. And you'll see further on, there's actually something from Henry Becker where he just listed out, um, the basics of, of the uh, project and the protocol, but basically any Debris is going to be put right into trucks, taken right off site. The site's tight. There's not really any room to do anything else um, besides that. Um, 
you can see it's the end of the property there. There's that cobbled driveway. And then as you go around back, there's just a very little lawn area. And then after that is the deck. Um, in the rear, you know, any staging necessary for, for redoing the back is placed right up on the deck. They probably put some plywood boards down on the deck if it's done before the new deck boards are down or even after just to either strengthen it if they haven't replaced them yet or protect the new deck boards if they have. Um, and I think if you go a couple more, you'll see Henry's, um, Henry's letter. This is in the VE 15 zone. Um, the structure itself on the assessor's card is valued at $460,000 and the work that we're doing is nowhere near 50% in this. And prior to moving forward on the, um, on the sort of second phase part, we will uh, be prepared to address uh, to Julia and to the committee, you know, if needed, the, um, the sort of whole 50% on both parts together. Um, so it's windows, replace windows, um, front left and right side, um, place the roof to the ridge in the front, clabbered siding, um, right and left, replace single uh, shingle siding with new uh, wood shingles, and in the rear, replace the deck boards with new wood. So it, it's pretty straightforward. This was one of those things where I had to make a judgment call whether to try to wait to get a hold of Julia because it was sort of a, on a Thursday, and uh, and I had to decide whether or not to make the filing deadline or wait to get a hold of Julia and see if we could do this administratively. So um, in the end, we just uh, took the extra cautious uh, step and and filed the RDA. But I hey, don't. John? Tom, yeah. Have, yeah. Have, has anyone had a chance to evaluate the structure underneath the deck? Is that has that been confirmed to to be stable or in, in good condition? Henry said he looked at it, and from what he could see, it looked like it was in good shape. He might have to sister a board or two, but it didn't look like there would be anything uh, significant at all. It was really the deck boards that were in rough shape. <clears throat> My only concern would be if they start if they run into you know rotten posts and and joists down there, then um, you know we wouldn't want them to to continue on 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 a, on a negative RDA with that condition. Yeah, I mean if the, if if anything happens that is unexpected when we uncover the deck, we would contact Julia and take whatever action would be appropriate. Um, at that point, one of the things that I did do, you'll see an aerial photograph in there. I sketched on um, an erosion control line. What I'm hoping is that um, they'll be able to snake. It'll probably just be a straw waddle, but under the um, under that kind of, or, or just along the wall, I would like to have something there as a precaution while they're doing the work and also to you know make it clear the limit of work. Um, but- uh, Tom, just a, yeah. a question along the lines of what Dan was asking. Um, yeah. That deck goes right out to the very edge of the sea. So it's essentially sitting on top of the seawall. Right. Is that? Yeah. So it is. So have they but done I, an evaluation of the seawall to make sure, because as we know, some of these seawalls are not in great shape, might need repair. Is this one okay? Have they looked at it? Structurally? I will, I, I can check with the applicant and we can certainly um, suggest that they do that. I do know that when, um, if you remember when we looked at the, and I think it's really connected to the wall next door, um, the, the seawall itself, the structural engineer on that felt that it was actually in pretty good shape. Um, suggested, I think maybe there was some repointing or something, but nothing, nothing of any yeah. significance. We wouldn't do any work on the seawall. Um, if it needed any, we could do that as part of the phase two filing with you guys, which Again, the phase two part still doesn't involve any work on the ground, um, at least as currently, uh, you know, reviewed by by Jennifer at the city and um, as as underway. That's just basically um, adding some living space and putting in a roof deck on the uh, on the water side. But that's not part of the RDA because we didn't have that material and you know at the time we were putting this together. Okay, and, and you do think that also the supports for the stack are in good shape? They just really need to replace the boards? Yeah, They're that's my understanding. Yeah, that's my understanding from talking to Henry that to the extent he could evaluate it, it looked in pretty good shape, except the 
the surface boards, but you know, he said once he gets in there, it might mean there might be a board or two that needs to be sistered up, you know, because you can't see everything. Off, but, um, but I don't envision any soil disturbance, and if there is anything, we would, um, you know, we would consult with you, Julia, and then come back to the commission as appropriate. Okay. So will this <clears throat> second floor deck be supported by the the ground level deck? No, no, the second floor deck would be cut into the roof line. So I, that that's so, so it's a separate thing. I sent this in. I mean, it would be wonderful if we could do it all all tonight, but I only you know I only got this recently, and then my email server was down, so I was only really able to coordinate with Julia on this today. But you can see how it's just it it's work up on the second floor. You can see um, in these drawings. There's no. You see the red dashed line in the um, second image over on the top. That's yeah. kind of the extent where that part of the roof line would be demoed and then it would be reconstructed to look like that um, sketch up view that's, you know, colored down there in the, the bottom left. Does the historic commission have to approve that sort of thing? I don't know this, this, um, you know, Henry's dealing with that and he's been to see Jennifer and I, I don't know the, um, the state of all those other things, except that Jennifer reviewed it all and uh, and is okay with it as um, as been proposed. But again, this is something where I haven't, you know, the the first part what we filed the RDA for was um, was something that was pretty simple, and this again looks pretty simple from a conservation point of view. But um, whether or not there are other permits or anything required, I think Henry. Um, said it was it was pretty clean, but I don't know what you know, I don't know what Jennifer has communicated to him on that. Yeah, I, I would think that the second or third floor work, second floor, third floor work would just be a matter of um, ensuring that the appropriate erosion controls were in place and that any right. um, vegetation lost around the structure would be replaced. Um, even right. now with redoing the siding, you know, there's some bushes right up against the house. Yep. that um, might need to be replaced if they have to be removed in order to get that work done. Right. And we, you know, if you want to do a negative three, that, um, you know, any vegetation impacts would be, uh, would be replaced or whatever, that, that's fine. Probably a good idea to, as well for the deck, as, as far as if there's any issues with that, making it a three. Yeah. Yeah, any anything beyond you know the the resurfacing and maybe sistering of a of a few boards underneath the deck um, that the contractor should notify the the agent seems like something along along those lines would make sense. I was I'm wondering if it would be um, appropriate or acceptable to have the uh, the the builder. Uh, at least rip up the, the uh, deck boards initially at the start of the project so we can see if there is any problem and if so, you know, get it addressed right up front. Yeah, and as I said, Henry has looked at it. Yeah, um, but right, and it's probably okay, but just, you know, just in case. It's, it's, so, so maybe upon removal of the deck boards, if there are any issues with it, with the underlying structure beyond, you know, sistering a few boards that, yeah. you know, the contractors will notify the um, conservation administrator or something to that effect. Right. To see whether additional permitting is required or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. I've said, I've drafted any changes to the scope um, or details of the work to the deck or footprint of the structure shall be presented to the commission for additional review and approval. Okay, and, and I, I have another question on, on the part two that we're not doing tonight. Sure. But, um, yeah, if that's a uh, zone, do we have to concern ourselves with uh, the percentage of increase in living space or the... Or right. The so we would we would before going forward with the phase two permitting we would um, we would have some more details on that but yeah. 
assessed value of the structure alone is 460. So there's yeah. significant room to do work on this house. Right. Yeah. So okay. okay. So, so so you'll just have all that in place for this for the second filing. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that needs to include all of the work from phase one as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. We have a we have a form that you can use to. Yeah. No. And I know Henry. Um, Henry will be applying for the building permits, and I'm sure the building department will will walk oh, in yeah. as well. Okay. Anything else? No. No. Get a motion. Motion for negative three determination uh, with the um, conditions that Julia described, including the vegetation. Second. All right. Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, next item is Megan Terry Ash, Tenla Valley Lane, request for certificates of compliance. Okay. Um, do we have anyone here for that project? If not, um, I think that's okay. I think I can explain th these two requests for certificates of compliance. Um, be helpful if, if their realtor was here, but she's not. So um, the owners of Ten La Valley Lane have, um, and I can bring up some photos of that site, but they are selling their property. And um, they're, this site was developed, um, it's within the Kelleher Pines subdivision, which is like, I don't know, 200 and something lot subdivision back in, it was permitted back in the like 1979 in the early 80s. And the file number for that is 051-0029. Um, uh, the developer left and then each individual homeowner was responsible for asking for a certificate of compliance for their own lots. And that's what we've been doing over the years is putting out these certificates of compliance that are really basically old based on this, this subdivision from 1979. Um, this particular lot, which was lot two in the Kelleher Pine subdivision, was not actually built on um, under the 051-0029 permit. It was left vacant. And for whatever reason, they didn't build on it at the time. And then in 1994, way long after the original subdivision permit had expired and been gone by the wayside, um, they, the, uh, the owner of the, someone purchased the lot, lot two, and filed notice of intent to develop it. And they received an order of conditions, they built the, the home, and then they received a certificate of compliance. And that was um, something like 051 dash, I don't, I don't remember the file number, four, 400 and something. Um, and so that's all been taken care of. So this, this actual site has actually been issued a certificate of compliance, but because it was part of the area associated with the original subdivision, it has attached to its deed that original order of conditions, as well as another order of conditions, which is one, one you're seeing here, 051-175 from 1988, that was the road work, utilities, culverts, drainage, etc., associated with the Kelleher Pines subdivision. Um, and so that got the same, this 175 order of conditions got attached to all these lots as well. And then the road work was done, the utilities were put in and somehow or other, it still um, was attached to all these individual lots deeds. So this, this family just needs to get this 051-175 and 051-0029 off of their deed. So and really Yep. Excuse me. Uh, yep. We have Charlie P. who is raising his hand. I don't know. Oh, good. Okay. Charlie, you're there. I, I am, but uh, keep going. Thank you very much. I just want to let you know that I was listening in. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to try to share with you now the photos associated with 
this project. Okay. Charlie, are you the real estate agent? Uh, no, I'm the attorney. Okay. Can you guys see Calvary. this? Can you see this photo now? No. 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 no you, you can't. Hold on a sec. Um, can you see it now? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is the home that was built um, at Tanla Valley Lane, which again was lot two as part of the original Kelleher Pine subdivision. Um, you can see this is the backyard. Um, there's no sort of impact from the site on any wetland areas. Um, and again, they've already received a certificate of compliance for construction of the house and all the landscaping and everything associated with it. It's really just a matter of um, getting rid of these two old orders that are attached to the deed. And um, sorry, hold on a sec, I need to share again. Um, Okay, um, in addition, when I was looking this all up, I found, because we've been going through this Kelleher Pine subdivision or uh, certificates of compliance for a while, I found that we issued, or I should say you all issued a certificate of compliance for Kelleher Pines, um, the 1979 subdivision um, was issued, We on Oct in October 2019, and you made it a complete certification, and it was issued to Kelleher. Um, I'm just wondering if the if this couldn't be sent in, and rather than each new homeowner who still doesn't have their certificate of compliance, if they can't just take this one and send it to the Registry of Deeds and have that. Maybe Charlie, you know the answer to that. Is that something that they could do? Can they use this Certificate of Compliance, which is a complete certification for 0510029? Can this just be taken by the homeowners to the Registry of Deeds and have it be applied to their deed and, and then again, anyone else's deed that is still outstanding? Yeah, I think that was our I, intent when we uh, issued this right. one. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, so I'm looking at it for the first time. I'm just trying to see what the reference is. Uh, the booking page, 87471941. Why don't you keep chatting? I'm going to look that up online. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, regardless of whether or not they can use this um, certificate of compliance and just take a copy and bring it to the Registry of Deeds, or whether they need you to issue a new one um my recommendation is that it it be issued because they didn't even the house wasn't even built under this particular order of conditions essentially it's in this one was in even not even valid for their um lot so and then 051-175 again was the road work and utilities that also um is not really relevant to their site right so, so perhaps on this one we can just issue the COC and then going forward, you can make that determination as to whether we can record for the entire okay. Uh, development. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just do a new one for this property um, like we have in the past and we'll put their book and page in and we'll put their name and address in up here. Um, but it will be a complete certification for 0029 to get it settled for this particular property. That makes Thank sense. You. And, and also one for the other 0175? And one, same for 0175. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we need a, we'll need a motion for both of them, vote on both of them. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll make a motion to issue a certificate of compliance for 51 dash 29 and 51 dash 175. Uh, should we vote on them separately? Yeah, I would say vote on them separately because oh, they need oh, to be okay. signed. They need, we need signature pages for each. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll amend that to uh, just a, uh, a motion to uh, issue a certificate of compliance for 51 dash 29. Second. 
All right, Paul Ailey. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. You need a motion for all Thank you. Five? Yeah, okay, then I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, issue a certificate of compliance for 51 175. Second. Paul Haley. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Hopefully that will be adequate for anybody else. Why do I have the wrong agenda up here? Sorry. You can't hear me up. anymore, right? No. Nope. Nope. Um, Charlie, I'm going to mute you. Unless you want to be unmuted, raise your hand. <clears throat> um, so this is, all right, yeah. this is the new, uh, new um, what you want to call it agenda um yeah all right i i had uh holly mcdonald next but uh, yes it is holly mcdonald next sorry this is uh i don't know how this old draft agenda got into the system um into okay. the pdfs but sorry about that so go okay. with what you have for the agenda joe okay um make a motion to open up public hearings so okay. moved, so moved. Second. All right, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. <laughs> yes. And I vote yes. Uh, first item is uh, Holly McDonald, 468th Street, Notice of Intent. Okay. Mike Seacamp, do you want to handle this one? I'm going to allow you to talk. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good evening. Um, for the record, Mike Seacamp, Seacamp Environmental Consulting. And um, at the last meeting uh, that we had, the last hearing for this project, uh, the, the commission requested some additional information. Uh, some of that information included separating the existing conditions from the proposed conditions on the record plan that we submitted. And what you have in front of you there now is the uh, existing conditions. You can see that on the, uh, on the west side of the property, there's uh, very little room between the house and the property line. Uh, and um, sub uh, previous to this, we um, also submitted uh, uh, the narrative with the photographs, and maybe we'll get to that later. But um, on the proposed conditions plan, we included a comparison of the uh, uh, footprint based on the uh, impervious surface. And uh, that's slightly different from the calculation of the footprint from a uh, contact with the ground. However, uh, the increase, the proposed increase is in the neighborhood of 13 uh, percent increase and that includes the deck, the stairs and the overhang. And um, I did a quick calculation of just the footprint on the ground and, and actually the, uh, the increase that I got was about 12 and a half percent. So it's, it's certainly in the ballpark. Uh, additionally, the, the commission requested that we uh, show the mitigation area. And I had submitted a uh, proposal to uh, fill in the gaps because this site where it isn't a parking area that's mostly gravel and sand um, does, uh, is populated by uh, beach grass. And uh, so we were going to fill in the uh, areas, but the commission wanted a specific area shown on the plan. And, and, and where that's located, if you look at the photographs that I previously submitted, you'll see that that's really the barest area. 
Um, but that will not be the only extent of our plantings. We will be filling in uh, the gaps uh, uh, between the existing um, beach grass. The, uh, on this plan, we have a chart showing the comparison of the, um, uh, it's in the other direction, Julia. Okay, and I apologize if this is sideways. Um, no. Adobe won't let me change it without. It won't, it won't let you, okay. It won't let me um, change it. Yeah, so number five there is the existing, including the stairs. Number six is the proposed, and then the total uh, proposed increase is 13.2%. And being in the AO zone, we are limited to, uh, has to be under 20%. So we're, we're significantly below that. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about the existing and proposed um, plan view. Uh, but if not, we can move on to the uh, elevation. The commission also requested um, elevation views. And what we're looking at here is the street side of the house. And on the street side, there will not be a curtain or uh, yeah, a curtain uh, extending below the, um, uh, the lowest support member, but the lowest support member is nine feet, six inches. And you can see that label on the, on the plan there. And that shaded area that you see is the skirt in the rear of the house. Um, that's the architect's rendering of, of the skirt. The, um, the elevation of the skirt is five, I believe it's 5.8 inches and that's shown on the uh, rear view and that's uh, sheet number four on that. Or I guess it would be sheet number eight. Okay, is this the right sheet? What, uh, that is right side, so it's at the bottom. One more, there you go. So that one's, uh, Let's see, it should be labeled 9.6. Uh, it was on a previous one, five feet eight inches. Oh, it was the previous one? one? Okay, great. Yeah. yeah, there you go, okay. Yeah, so the um, from the average um, elevation, which is 14 uh, on the lot, uh, it goes up, so the, um, yeah, that's uh, 5.5 feet eight inches to the skirt, but to the uh, lowest support member is actually nine feet six inches. Nine feet. Have to turn okay. it sideways. But so the <laughs> lowest lowest horizontal member um, is essentially at five feet eight inches, uh, not including the stairway and the utility chase. So there will be no siding or um, lattice or other enclosures below five feet eight inches. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yep. So uh, so that's the elevation view. Um, be happy to answer any questions on that. Um, if not, we can move to the a uh, more detailed uh, comparison between proposed, existing and proposed. Um, Stay there, yeah. So on the top is the existing and the commit, and it, it was somewhat confusing and the deck is, uh, is not exactly uh, rectangular. Uh, the architect prepared this um, comparison. These are the same numbers that we used on the proposed plan that the um, surveyor uh, provided waypoint survey and uh, basically on this plan the uh, the cross hatched areas is the impervious and it includes the roof overhangs both on the existing building and on the proposed and that's where we came up with the the increased number of 13.2 uh, percent and um, let's see I think that I think that pretty much covers the questions that uh, were left hanging the last time. I think the mitigation was one of the more significant ones, but uh, I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions. Anybody? No, I, I, I think this is what we asked for. Michael, do you have a planting plan for the mitigation area? Uh, that was included. It is included in the. Uh, I, I, did, I did include um, that. It was included in the revised um, project narrative uh, 
submitted on uh, July 14th. But yeah. I did, I did um, uh, include on my memo that I included with these, with these, uh, with this new information. Uh, the mitigation area shown is 10 by 20 rectangle on the north side of the house. This is the sandy area where the existing beach grass, Emophilia, Emophila gavili gulata, is the most sparse. The plantings will be as originally provided in the project narrative, three columns per hole, 18 inches to 24 inches apart, a total of 200 Emophila gavili gulata columns will be planted. And so I've included it in this memo as well. Now on the plan, you show the mitigation area, but you had indicated that there'd also be some additional planting. Well, the uh, if 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 we can go to the um, the photographs on that uh, project narrative that I mentioned, um, it would be on uh, I believe page three. Yeah, I, I was, where I was coming from was I just wanted to make sure that on some plan that they would. Yeah, the next the next one down, Julia. Yeah, see that area there? Yeah. That's where we're showing the 10 by 20. Um, so we're not, you know, we're, we're, we're going to space them. So we don't want to crowd the ones that are there. So, um, but that's where, that's where it's going to be. And that's going to be pretty thickly vegetated when we're done. Okay. And that's the only place that you'll be doing the planting? In, on the north side of the, of the house. Yes. Okay. And we, we also said that we were going to replant uh, or replace that uh, eastern red cedar that you see there. Yeah. Where that would just be somewhere else on the lot. It wouldn't be replaced right there, correct? Uh, I, I would leave that up to the, to the homeowners. Um, it, it's possible we could save that, that particular tree, but it's also possible that it could succumb uh, from being moved. Um, but th this property is fairly, it's, it's a small property. It's only about a, it's a little over a 10th of an acre, but, um, I, I, I'm not aware of too many that only have beach grass <laughs> and, uh, and one native, uh, uh, tree. So, uh, that's the way they want to keep it. Well, that's fine. But they, they can do either replant one or, or try and move that one or try and keep that one. That's, that's fine. Okay. So do we have anything else? Are, are there some hands raised? What's that, David? Is there hands raised? I, I'm just, um, no. Okay. You should put your hand down. <laughs> um, okay, you got anything else? What do you want to do? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Paul Healy? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Cam Warshaw? Yes. David Vine? Yes. Jane Sender? Yes. Ron DeCola? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, before we get to the next item, um, I have to send a couple things out. And I am sending something out to um, Lisa and Tom and Mike Abel at DEP and also the commission. Um, before we get into uh, anything from the applicants on uh, for uh, Chris Horan, Seacoast Homes LLC, 192 Northern Boulevard, Notice of Intent, uh, I would like to uh, do a bit of a presentation on some uh, impact analysis that I've done on this uh, property. Uh, Julie, you have that? Uh, yeah. Yep. Let me bring that up. Um, is this it, Joe? Yeah, 
Okay, so I did some documentation on vegetation present um, at 192 Northern Boulevard and uh, some of the impacts that have happened uh, on this page, which is from one of the latest, uh, one of the latest, we apparently there's a new uh, site plan, but this is the one that we had and I worked off of. Um, it shows uh, some sand areas and some gravel areas. Uh, if you want to go to the next page, Julie. So these are these uh, yellow circles roughly give you an idea of the uh, condition of the uh, beach grass and other plants uh, located on the, uh, the Northern Boulevard side of the property. Uh, and you can see that there are, um, there's grass growing on these areas. Um, the, particularly the uh, October 2019 photos show that it is, it's denser grass in these areas. Uh, if you can go to the next one, Julie. This is uh, looking at it from 63rd Street. You can see uh, an increase. Obviously you see a car park there, but you can see a distinct increase in the amount of uh, grass and plants there. Um, uh, as of October 2019. Um, now if you want to go down to the next one, Julie. So this is an aerial photograph on the city MEMAP website. This photograph shows three vehicles parked on 192 Northern Boulevard, uh, clearly impacting the, uh, the plant life growing there. Um, one, one is, two of them are clearly part of the, uh, well, all three of them are clearly part of the development going on at uh, three and five uh, 63rd Street. Um, and it shows the, the damage done. There's, there is, according to this aerial photo, which was taken uh, at some point after April 20th this year, uh, you can see a distinct lack of any um, plant life where these trucks are parking. You can see a lay down area that is next to the um, center truck, center white pickup truck to the right of it behind the telephone pole. Um, so there was uh, some significant impact to the, uh, to the site. Uh, you can go to the next page, Julie. This, uh, this is an overlay of the site plan um, showing how these vehicles are um, pretty much, they're, they essentially were creating the, the, open, the open areas here, the sand areas and the, the gravel areas. So you, you can also see in the, in the previous picture, you can see all sorts of tire tracks um, down next to the white truck. Uh, and I'm, I expect at certain points, uh, these areas were probably full of vehicles. So, um, so there's no, no doubt that there was uh, significant damage caused to these, uh, these areas with the use of these vehicles. Um, all right, you wanna to go to the next page, Julie? And I did some uh, calculations using the city MEMAP website to calculate the impact. Um, in this one, it is the area uh, just inside the property lines. Uh, the, uh, the impact was just over 2,000 square feet. And the um, GIS area of this uh, lot, even though it doesn't match the the numbers um, on the cards for these lots um, was 8,400, you know, 8,451 square feet. So this impact was just over 24% of the entire lot. Um, I'm going to go to the next um, image. This one, this one measures the entire dune on the lot. Um, 
and the, uh, the impact caused by this, uh, this activity where uh, just over 20, um, just under 2,800 square feet uh, were, um, were denuded by the trucks, which is a, uh, the, uh, the overall area of the dune and you know, the uh, associated dune with this lot uh, was uh, about 9,000 square feet. So this area ended up being about 30, 31% of the total dune area on this, uh, on this lot. Um, so what is my, the last one I think is my, uh, my statement. Yeah, um, and I'm gonna, uh, I'll just read this out. For the record. In conclusion, Chris Horan, the owner of Seacoast Homes LLC, is a veteran of development on Plum Island. He's currently finishing construction on two buildings on two lots directly abutting 192 Northern Boulevard. As such, you should be aware of the requirements prohibiting unper unpermitted alteration of a coastal dune. Despite this, Mr. Horan decided to use 192 Northern Boulevard is a parking lot and staging area for his and or his contractor's vehicles and construction materials. Doing this has resulted in a loss of thousands of square feet of vegetation on this lot and the associated dune. Save for the northernmost sand area along 65th Street, which a neighbor clearly used as a parking area. Most of the area where these vehicles destroyed the veg vegetation is called out as open sand or gravel, as shown in figure five above, um, in the site plan for this notice of intent submission. The above proof directly contradicts comments made by the applications, the applicants representatives claiming that the lack of vegetation was in part a result of neighbors parking on this area and, and that there was gravel present also. The above photos show these claims were not true um, as a result of the uh, aforementioned unpermitted unprim alterations, I believe the commission should seriously consider issuing an immediate enforcement order against Mr. Horan and Seacoast Homes for the damages vehicles have vehicles and related activities that have caused to this dune. I believe this lot should be restored to at least how it was in October 2019, and restoration has to include the gravel and sand driveways driveway areas which could not revegetate because uh, the applicant used them as parking staging areas while constructing these neighboring bu buildings. And I believe this restoration should begin immediately. Um, as it stands now, uh, I will be voting no on any motion issue in order conditions for this project. That includes any offer to include restoration as part of the order conditions, as I do not think it is at all reasonable in this case. I don't think the commission should even consider issuing, issuing an order of conditions until the slot is restored. For his own convenience, this applicant demonstrated a blatant disregard for the dune on this property and should not be given the benefit of the doubt. Thank you. Um, any commissioners want to comment or ask questions? Um, I am happy to give the applicant and his uh, representatives all the time they need to uh, discuss this. All right, well, it's off to... Um, when we were out there in June on the site visit, um, it, it seemed to me that a lot of the vegetation, particularly along Northern Boulevard, had, had sort of grown back. I don't recall seeing quite so much bare ground, but I, I could be wrong. Well, I think I saw a bit, but I don't remember the exact conditions as it was out there. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yeah. I, I just wanted you to know, I, when, uh, when the commission is done commenting on your um, presentation, I would, I would like to, uh, to open up. Yeah, um, that's fine. Are we set at this point? Obviously, you can. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think uh, I'd like to review what you would put together, but I don't see why that uh, should 
hold us back. No. Oh no. No. We're, I'm I'm fine with going ahead with with whatever they're presenting tonight. But all right, Lisa, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, uh, Lisa Mead, Mead, Tellerman, and Costa, on behalf of the applicant uh, for the property at 192 Northern Boulevard. Um, it would have been uh, great to see this in advance so that we could also do the overlays, but I certainly appreciate the work that you have put into this, um, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, I think that it is important to note that, um, again, I would like to examine this as well, that in fact, um, Mr. Hughes did say that there were a number of areas that he thought were damaged that he did not take into consideration in his calculations relative to the proposed disturbance and then revegetation on the site. Um, and I think that um, Steve is correct for uh, when we were out there, some of this vegetation had grown back. And I, I think that if you look at this lot over the years, um, there is a, uh, not just in the last year or two years, but certainly over the last 10 years, I think there was something that was back further than that. But there has been, particularly around the edges, um, you know, obviously everybody knows about the 65th Street parking lot, or uh, parking space. We were all out there when the, uh, the abutter very clearly said, you know, look, we, somebody graveled this and we park here. So that everybody knows that that exists. Um, and that off and on, the area along Northern Boulevard um, is vegetated and not vegetated, quite frankly, dependent on how bad the winter has been and how great the fishing season might be. Um, and then similarly, depending on how active the house was at the, uh, on 63rd Street, um, that area that's used as a parking space beside the former structure, which was not in the middle of the lot. And again, we have some, um, obviously our overlay plans will show it, that that was not um, that was not fully vegetated, but I don't think that we disagree, Mr. Chair, that there was a lot of vegetation up along 63rd Street, and I don't believe that uh, Mr. Hughes took that into account. And I think it's going to be important. Um, and obviously, you have great concern about this, and I and I don't doubt that at all. Um, but I would like to have uh, Mr. Hughes go through the calculations that he's done and based upon the areas that he's calculated. The applicant has significantly um, changed his plans, I think reduced the impact and moved them forward and, and whatnot we wanna go over with the commission. Um, but as the commission knows, um, we've certainly provided our memorandum in advance relative to uh, the use of the calculation for no net um, impact um, really is a methodology that people use for convenience, but it's not the standard in um, the regulations relative to how you deal with impact on a dune um, and whether or not the um, eventual construction and or replanting and or disturbance actually uh, diminishes the value of the resource area um, or disturbs the dune um, such that it disturbs the dune in its entirety. So I'm not gonna get into all of the details of that right now, but I do, particularly since you've provided this presentation, I think that it's really important to um, have Tom go through his analysis, how he recalculated it based upon our last meeting and then our site visit, and in addition, the redesign of uh, the property on site. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Tom before we go back and talk about how we move forward. Okay, good evening. Good evening. Um, Julia, if you could put on the, um, the plan with the images on it, and I realized what we had submitted was, was actually the wrong version. I did email you an updated one, which is just clearer to read, and it might be helpful. We do intend on uh, continuing to the next meeting because we're still trying to have some more communication with DEP. But um, we can work with this one if you want to, or I did email in one. That, when did you email me something, Tom? Um, it was when I when I was preparing, so it was like six o'clock. It is this plan, but the three panels are actually supposed to be more different to help you kind of better understand. But um, we can work with this if you want. So if you um, 
If you could zoom in as an example, if you could zoom into the area along 65th Street. 65th or 63rd? 65th, just to start okay. with that parking area. What we did, so, so first of all, the, the original um, vegetative delineation was done in the field by me working with the surveyor prior to any work or any construction activity on the adjacent lots and was based on the conditions that I observed at the time. And I think the date of the survey is on the plan that we submitted um, at some point, but I think it was like June-ish, July-ish uh, 2019. And I can get you that, that date. Um, after the site visit and after the first hearing, um, there were a lot of questions about the sand areas and everything. So we looked at uh, the two most recent aerial photographs available, 2019 and 2017. Um, in those uh, aerials, so 2017 was a MyMap one, which I'm unable to download in a, in a uh, version that we can import into CAD and work with at a, at a true scale. But we compared that to the 2019 image. And the 2019 image is an ortho photo that was taken, I think, in February of 19. Um, I can get the exact date for the commission if you'd like. And that is something as geo-referenced that we can work with. So we imported that. And if you look to the left of the area labeled sand, you'll see that gray area that kind of zigzags and goes off. That we removed from our calculation area right there because on the 2019 image, it was taken earlier in the year before we did the field work. And I'm guessing that what happened is as the summer started up, people parked more and impacted that vegetation. So what I saw when I did my field work didn't exist when the area was taken. And it also didn't exist in the 2017 one as clearly. So, um, so we removed that from our, from our area. Um, and that, if we can go down, I can show you some other areas where we did the same thing. So we reduced the areas we were claiming to things that not only were observed in the field prior to any construction disturbance on site. And I think I, pretty readily said there was construction disturbance that um, went beyond some of the areas that have been used for parking and that uh, our intent is that those would be restored as part of the COC process on those other lots um, back to what we documented prior to work starting, which was the survey work. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see an area that we carved out of what we were claiming along um, along uh, Northern Boulevard. The other thing you'll note is if you note the, um, the green lines, in our original submission, we had your sort of typical surveyor locate shrub thing, which was much more of a cloud. This is an actual survey of the perimeter of the plants as they existed after our site visit. If you remember, we discussed it during the site visit and, and at the prior hearing that those were sort of more typical, you know, the, the surveyor typically locates the center of a shrub area, a couple shots on the outside and does a cloud that pretty much approximates it. We located every single one of those um, shrubs, their beach plum with bittersweet growing uh, in and amongst them um, in, the, in the shrub cluster in the center. Um, if we can scroll down, um, Okay, so this is the corner where we had the gravel area, which we provided you with pictures in our NOI filing of the state of things when I did the, uh, the field work, um, the sand area, but there was this dark shaded area. So we removed, if you see the label there, we removed the vegetation from the sand total. When we did the survey, that area was sand. When the photo was taken in 19, and consistent with 17, there was shading in that area. So you can see that it, polygon was removed. There's another one that kind of cuts into the stairway of the proposed structure that was removed. So we reduced what we were claiming as unvegetated area on property based on the kind of the, the union between the 2019 image and the field work, and it was consistent with the 2017 image. The next thing we did after doing all that work is we made some changes to the structure. So we moved the stairway on the left further towards the street and we trimmed down the driveway so that we had less impact from that. Um, Eileen incorporated uh, 
uh, sprinkler systems into the structure so that we can get rid of one means of egress. So we got rid of a stairway on the right hand side of the structure. The other thing we did, if you can scroll up to the shrub area, is the structure was um, reduced in some areas and also pulled slightly back towards the street and we lifted the elevation of, and I'll go through the architecturals, basically get us completely, with all our piles, we are now out of the beach plum area and where we clip it, the lighter tan there is a second floor um, cantilevered balcony. So we're up about 20 feet off grade with that cantilevered bal balcony and the area where it juts out on the first level is also cantilevered, but that's, um, you know, eight, nine feet up in the air and it's over a very low um, area of that, those shrubs. We also identified two much smaller saplings of, um, of the beach plum that are in the footprint of the structure a little further down and those will be transplanted on site. We also propose to bolster within the sparse area that surrounds those shrubs on the right hand side. You may remember from the site visit and I have to say that area is actually less vegetated than an area of planting that you just considered in a prior filing. I didn't count that area as not vegetated because to me, it had enough dune grass that I couldn't really count that as a non-vegetated area. But we would increase the density of planting within the sparse area, similar to your, your prior applicant, by increasing the amount of beach plum up in that area. Um, the other thing, if we can scroll down um, a little bit, um, so up a, up a hair, the red snow fence, we went over the site with the pile driving company and they can keep their equipment within that um, red line so they would not go into or drive into those um, beach plum and they can drive all the piles necessary from behind that. So that would be the limit of heavy, any heavy equipment operating uh, on site. Um, I think what would be helpful now if we could go to the architectural plan. Yep. So you can see here, what we did is we have the skirting. If you can look at the, um, the two views on the, on the left, um, the structure at the rear, as we get near those shrubs is completely open from where that skirting ends back. Inside the structure, if you can see down on the bottom one, there's a note, that skirting will go across to block people from walking through the structure into the vegetated portion of the site. And that's an important element. And when we go to the site plan, I'll explain why. Um, but we're also significantly up above the ground. So, so we believe that we will not impact that beach plum stand um, for years to come, but we also would be adding an additional 12 beach plum to expand the area. Um, the other thing that we are offering is we would put a deed restriction that would basically protect that vegetated area outside the development footprint on site. And now if we can go to the site plan. So this site plan didn't change. The only thing that changed was the graphical um, representation of the vegetation. We had three panels that showed the three different steps we took in the vegeta vegetation analysis. So here you can see um, the, uh, the split rail fence that is shown on the current site plan, leaving the rear corner of the um, uh, uh, the rear right near the house in the, um, the shrub area. Okay, yes. right there, right. And then it runs over to the property line all the way up to 65th, all the way over and all the way down. And on as currently shown, it stops right before 63rd. Our plan as described in narrative form in our most recent email to the commission and to DEP is that we would actually now extend that all the way down to 63rd over and back up around and connect into the building next to the stairway. So basically what we would end up doing is encapsulating and we would bring the other, the other end of the fence right up to the building corner so that basically we would be fencing off the vegetated part of the site um, from the house and the development area. It doesn't mean that 
the resident who lives there can't walk into the vegetated area, pick some beach plums, enjoy the vegetated area, but that physical presence of the fence will do something that if, if you look at this lot over time, both during the, the cycle of the year, right? There are times of the year when it recovers in the vegetative fashion and there are times of the year when it doesn't. And I've seen fishermen park there, I've seen neighbors park there. And, you know, there are some core areas and I believe the areas that we show on our original survey plan is being impacted that are impacted by those fishermen and neighbor, neighborhood uses. The construction impact has certainly exacerbated that. Um, and we're not taking any credit and we fully intend on, on restor restoring those areas that were damaged um, beyond what was on the site uh, at the start of that construction period. But, the, um, but in terms of what we'd be looking at is you look at this corner on 63rd and Northern has been heavily impacted by parking, but also by snow plows pushing snow up in that area. Um, and the fact since it's a, a vacant lot, the property owner really doesn't have any incentive to restrict access or stop these ongoing impacts. Although my understanding is he tried from here, you know, here and there over the years to to stop encroachments of people parking on the property, but to kind of to no avail. Um, what we would be doing is we would be stopping all that. If you remember during the site visit, there's even a little bit of a deer trail where people seem to cross over the lot on their way to the beach um, from Northern Boulevard. All of that regular and, and kind of ongoing changing anthropogenic impacts that, um, that affect how the dune functions on the site on an ongoing basis because of its location, you know, two street corners on, on uh, you know, on a busy street. Um, and, and, you know, in and amongst the neighborhood, we would basically be curtailing that and allowing that whole vegetated dune to be free of disturbance outside the footprint of what we're proposing, which is a really modest and small, uh, you know, single family home uh, for a double lot that's paid a betterment uh, for the sewer. So I think what we've, what we've got in our proposal is a pretty good and sound one and you know we i've seen the you know the information the chairman's provided and i need time now to go through and analyze that there is some overlap with areas that were documented uh, you know both through aerials for example the driveway that comes over from the neighbor the ongoing impacts that that we can uh, exclude from what the contractor did that were documented before the contract was started but we can certainly identify the areas that were impacted beyond that by the contractor and come up with a planting plan for those other um, projects to be responsible for replanting. Um, whether that's done before or after construction happens on this site, we can certainly work with the commission on that. Um, but those construction impacts are in no way related to what we've provided for existing conditions and not related to what we're proposing on the, on the project. Um, with that said, the, the one thing that DEP um, uh, that we're trying to work out with them is one of the things that we mentioned as part of the ongoing anthropogenic impacts on site was the fact that during the water and sewer project, as people tell me, this was one mm -hmm. of the that was used by the uh, sewer contractor for storage of materials, the lay down area, whatever. And that, um, you know, based on my review, of aerials, it does look like it restored after that, but it was an impact to this lot that happened over time. DEP, however, is um, because a certificate of compliance was never issued for the water and sewer project, uh, feels that all areas that were supposed to have been restored by the city somehow have to have been maintained restored since then, which gets into a huge hornet's nest because mm -hmm. it's not the only site that was impacted by the water and sewer project. <clears throat> who knows what the state of those sites is now and you know probably at no fault of the city probably areas that were you know restored by the contractor are in a different shape now some of them may even have been built on so we're trying to separate the water and sewer issue from um you know in terms of the restoration of water and sewer sites from 
how they're reviewing the vegetation on the site. Um, so with that, uh, with regards to, you know, the analysis I've done, I'm happy to answer any questions. With regard to the chairman's analysis, I really need time with it to review it, to take a look at those various things. Um, you know, I do, I do note some of the things I saw in some of the, cur the street side imagery is the, um, the cedar, I think it's a cedar that's over by uh, Northern Boulevard. I'm trying to stretch my memory right now is much smaller in some of those photos. And so does the shrub stand behind it. Um, and they're undated, so it's difficult to say exactly when, but, but this site clearly has been impacted over the years in different ways and in different severities and different months. Um, and, and I do know I saw plenty of people when the parking lot was closed at the end that were uh, parking there to get to the beach, uh, many with fishing rods, but, uh, you know, the, this is just a, a place where if there's no house there, so people take advantage of it. Um, I have a question, Tom, before we end this. Um, yeah. you've, got, you've, shown, you've shown us where the fence is going to go, the split rail, which is going to sort of like right. cover the back, this whole back part towards 65th Street and then down all the way along Northern Boulevard over to yeah. the stairway here. But what what goes on so, in this area to the right. east of the house? So actually, I, I sort of misthought that through as I was explaining the change. What would happen there is it would come all the way down to 63rd to the corner and go over to the driveway and then come back, kind of go around the propane tanks. Um, yeah. You know, but it would basically limit where people are going to be actively walking and using the outside to those areas that we're showing you as being altered. Yeah, because I just, I, I like to try and be realistic when we think about how the site is going to be used once people are living here. Right, um, right. You know, they're going to want some outside space too. Um, but the way this is all calculated doesn't leave room for that. So, right, and so and so that gets to so so that does get to the thing with the one to one calculation. The one to one, if you actual performance standard, um, it requires you to think about dune function and how the vegetation impacts dune function, um, and that's a kind of a difficult lift for every single site for the commission to review and for applicants to provide. So we've kind of simplified that over the years to this one to one thing that we, in, in most cases, fits the bill, right? If we do one-to-one, -one, you know, then we're kind of good. Um, but the vegetation standard doesn't say one-to-one. -one. Um, no, it, but uh, if you would ask, yeah. just from personal experience, if you would ask CZM, Coastal Zone Management, what they, how they interpret the vegetation standard and the, and the regulations for coastal dune, they would say that you can't replicate, that they don't want any existing um, healthy vegetation removed at all. So there's different ways to look at it. Um, I know there's some legal precedent for looking at it with a one-to-one -one or a dune function sort of standpoint, but there are others who would say that any removal of vegetation destabilizes the dune period. So Right, and, 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 and that gets into um, the things, and this, this is getting into an area that I think, you know, Lisa's provided a memo on and, and we can we can get into a little bit. I think you guys need time to review that, and then um, and then maybe we can talk more about it at the next meeting. But the the CCM can have their their opinions on things, but ultimately it's the administrative decisions that ultimately. Well, yeah. Well, what I mean is right. that there's no rule anywhere about it. Right. Different, right. Which is it's right. Site, it's really a site specific kind of a determination that needs to get made by the commission. Right. Um, on each site without those standards to go by. Um, there is nothing guiding them towards or away for away from one to one or that requires them to allow any removal of vegetation for that matter. Well, I no, just I think, wanted to make that clear. Well, if, I, if I could just pop in here for a second. So Julia, you're right. Um, it, I mean, it's a, it's a combination of factors, right? Because ultimately the question for, under the regulations is, is the, um, is there an adverse effect such that it diminishes uh, the value of the resource area? And so that has been looked at in a number of different ways. And certainly the issue of, of net replacement one-to-one -one is, is one of the ways to determine it, but it's not the sole way I think is the, is the, is the issue here. And certainly 
um, it, there actually is administrative decisions that say you can reduce the vegetation if the quality of vegetation that you put back is better. Um, or you can add more, a higher quality of, of vegetation to the site. So I think that what we're trying to show here is that um, this is a lot that has had a lot of impact over the years. And I'm, I'm not talking about the, the current impact from construction. Let's, I, I understand what the chairman is saying, but I'm talking about the impact over the years absent the, the construction. And the, and it's a buildable lot. And so the question is, um, how do you and can you use the lot to construct a single family home, which is the allowed use on the lot, um, without diminishing the value of the resource area? And what we are trying to show and what I believe Tom has tried to show is that we can do a number of things on this property to A, enhance the vegetation on it, and be protected in the long run, which it's not being done right now um, for, and for all of the reasons that Tom has said. So um, I, I think that you're right. And I think that the commission and DEP takes all of these on a case by case basis for sure. Um, we're not talking about a primary dune here and we're talking about a lot that is sided by three, on three sides by a street a main street on Plum Island that has development all around it. Um, and so the question is, how do you protect this area of the dune? And how do you improve the protection? And can we actually, even though we're not required to, can we actually improve the value of the resource area that exists, even at the same time as we construct a home on here? And so I think that, um, we certainly have to look at what the chair has done and we want the commission to consider what we're proposing. Um, but I think that th that was the purpose of my memorandum was to say, we have to look at all of these things, that it's not a net no loss issue here. Um, we have to look at all of the items. So, so getting into the, the improving quality, what we're trying to do by improving and improving quality is the fencing off to stop the ongoing impacts, the additional beach plum and protecting that beach plum cluster and allowing it to grow and expand. Um, which to me, the beach plum area is probably providing the greatest function on this lot. Um, and it's got bittersweet in it. So we're, the other thing I didn't mention is that um, we are committed to controlling the bittersweet as well as part of this. Um, so we believe that we can and, and there are sparse areas and the sparse areas that are to the right of the stand in, in, in between those beach plum that are shown there is very similar to the planting area that you just saw presented to you on 68th Street. So we would be planting within that area to increase the density, putting in those beach plum. We can also put in dune grass around that if there's any uh, bare spots as well. But we, can, we think that we can do a single family home here and then provide a way of having a vegetated area with a deed restriction that just reinforces that people cannot alter the vegetation without any approval from the commission um, in, in those protected areas. Uh, so it's something that when somebody buys this, it's going to be brought to their attention because not only is it just an order of conditions that's among the, the many papers, it's actually right there in the deed um, explicit. The other thing is the area that we are not touching at all, which is the, you know, the, the half of the lot that is towards 65th is immediately adjacent to the untouched lot that is part of the five family. So you'll still have in this section of Plum Island pretty much preserved forever these two um, lots side by side by each with each other um, that are going to provide a nice area of dune in the middle of this fairly densely developed area um, and will continue to provide some good dune function. In addition, this thing's elevated on piles, open and underneath. Sand will be able to move around. Floodwaters will be able to move around. Um, the dune will continue to function with the house there um, and it's a real small footprint. So we we believe that any impacts from a single family home are as small as they can possibly be 
and that our um, preservation and protection of the dune to prevent ongoing impacts that will occur whether you know whether we like it or not they will occur on this lot if nobody buys a home and nobody has to protect the property and if somebody's not allowed to you know build here i doubt the property owner is going to invest in a fence you know so um, um, is that adjacent lot that um is going to remain undeveloped also going to be fenced off so that people can't access it and unfortunately that permit was already issued and and um and and it's too late i think because there's a homeowners association there that that now uh you know i suppose we could approach but lisa what what what's your feeling on that with that homeowners association um right so we've already um we've already got um a uh purchase and sale agreements regarding that and approved condominium documents. So I'd have to talk to Chris and the, every one of those units is under agreement. So um, I'd have to talk to Chris about the ability to put, is Steve, is your request about whether or not a split rail fence could run along 65th street there? Yeah. And, um, and capture that I, other lot. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Yeah, I, so maybe along 65th, but not into the lot. Let me, um, let me. Ha I'm gonna have to talk to Chris about that um, before we come back. But um, that's the struggle we have. But I certainly understand your request. One thing I will point out, and Lisa, you will remember the language better than I do. But the commission did require us to have language in the homeowners document that does prevent those um, owners from altering that area. Yeah, no, that's in the. Yeah, for sure, that's in the. Um, Condo docks, for sure. Right. But that's not so going to prevent somebody from parking there, you know, uh, unrelated well, to the homeowners. Yeah. I get, I, I, Steve, I certainly understand the, the question. I'm going to, uh, you know, this, the sad thing about our Zoom meetings is you can't get answers on the fly, right? Um, because I don't have my client sitting here right next to me. Right. So we will, um, cer I certainly understand the request and we will get back to you on that. Um, now, how, many, how many bedrooms are in this house? Um, I think, um, do you have the floor plans? Um, I don't think we have the floor plans. Let me- I think it's two in an office, maybe. Three bedrooms. Eileen just texted me, three bedrooms. Okay, so there will be a family there with kids, presumably. Um, yeah, it's a small house, Steve. Um, the right. house next door sold, um, and it, there's no, in this three bedrooms, there's no children in that house. It's a, it's a small house. Okay. Um, just, that's not saying there's not going to be kids there, but it's it's a small house. Because the the way this plan is set up, the only the only outside area that kids could play in is the driveway. Or the beach down the road. Yeah, but um, I mean we can we can we can look um, if we can scroll up to the impact table as we've calculated based on you know let's let's at least for now put aside the debate on what vegetation we're counting or not counting, and at least based on our current numbers, we were increasing vegetated area. And if we look at the table, we might have enough to be able to put some small area off the driveway, but we really were trying to keep our impacts as small right. as possible. No, I understand, but I mean, if, if, if there's a family there with kids. Well, you got under the, you got under the building too, you know? Yeah. I, I, I know it's interesting though, Steve, I, I've not, you know, I, I certainly don't attend every conservation commission meeting on Plum Island, but I don't I don't recall having this conversation on any other lot on Plum Island about kids playing outside. Right, but in well, most places there there is some area where they can play, and, and and on this particular lot, the way it's set up, it's just driveway. I mean, I I'm all for you know yeah. as much vegetation as possible, but let's be realistic. Yeah, and we also, and, and and we also have a roof deck well, by the way for outdoor the, space. The thing is that a lot of times when we get a proposal for a house or an addition to a house or whatever renovations on Plum Island, it incorporates a patio and some walkways and, a, uh, you know, some outside usable space, um, whatever that looks like meeting the regulations. And this has nothing, not only does it have nothing, there's really no allowance even to make it possible because there's, we're taking up every square foot of you know, sort of impact area. That, that's all I think. Is that what you're trying to say, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think that, 
Yeah, I think it's a good point and we can look right. at it. The most equivalent property that I think I would compare it to would be the K Street hmm. one that was developed. That didn't really include any outdoor right. space. Um, it had to be and, in the middle of it too. Yeah, and, and, and that, yeah. That one, I think, has pretty successfully, um, you know, when I've driven by, I have not seen that people have gone outside the limit of what we expect. Yeah, it looks like it's being, and, and there's a fence on that one, too, if I can remember correctly. Um, not and, a, yeah, and, not as complete yeah. as this. No, but, yes. but it does sort of fence off that heavily vegetated area of the site, and it does look like that's been preserved really well over right. time. Um, so that is good. Um, right. And if you um, remember that one, we, you know, our, our challenge on non-vegetated areas was so extreme. We were picking up eight square foot areas and we yeah. um, included a paved section of the road that had to I be know. I remember. going under a deck. So this is, you know, this is a better plan in terms of there's no provision that we have to remove pavement to, to make this work you know, which was something that happened on the K Street project. So in terms of the, the precedent of the commission and looking at these things, um, you know, I believe this is consistent with these unvegetated lots, how they've been treated. And I think that we've, we've tried to make this as, as least impactful as possible and, and benefit Dune function with our vegetation plan as much as we can. Um, Steve, I just, um, I've been texting with Chris. Um, He's okay with running a, a split rail fence along the other property on 65th, but we need to get um, authorization from uh, the folks who we have purchase and sale agreements with. So we'll get back to you on that. Okay. And the plan is a foot off the pavement with that fence. Um, right. Along Northern, we can go right along the lot line, um, but because the, the uh, right away is vegetated there, but on the, um, on the other street areas, we would have to, since the pavement comes into the property, we'd want to be a foot off so that we don't create a, an obvious, you know, you know, an, an ask for a, for a car to hit it or for a plow to damage it. But. So we'll, so when we come back, obviously we're going to um, examine um, what the chair provided. Uh, we're going to show the split rail fence um, where Tom has now discussed it. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to reevaluate the outdoor area. We're going to talk to the um, purchasers of the of the units in the five unit to make sure that we can throw a sp split rail fence along 65th to help prevent um, access over there too. Um, and I'd be interested to hear if, it, if the commissioners have anything else to add to that. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, you had said before that uh, you had these issues with DEP, and I think Tom had actually included us in some kind of an email chain that yes. kind of died abruptly. Uh, I'd like to see what that is all about and if, if that has any impact on uh, our evaluating the site. Right, and so so, so we have, to, to answer that, we have not gotten the response from DEP, and I believe it is because Rachel Freed was out um, for a good amount of time during that period, and my guess is Mike wanted to coordinate with her on a response, so I've been trying to get a hold of them, but they only have five people in the Nero office at any given time. Um, everybody else's work at home, so it's very difficult right now to coordinate with DEP. Well, it'd be good to see if that comes to conclusion and for us to understand that. The other thing that you mentioned, Tom, was about the water and sewer contract yeah. using this as a staging area. Who gave that contractor permission to do it? Was it the I, owner? I don't know. Somebody, and I, I forget who told me this lot had been used and, it, and other people I can't remember if it was somebody in the neighborhood, but it was conveyed to me that, you know, that the city had used this lot, so why couldn't you build a house here kind of thing? And it didn't it's come from the usually applicant. usually the way it would work on private property. And it's usually the contractor that would make the arrangements. Right, but, and, and I believe if I, I looked at the aerial photographs and I could see that um, it looked like it had been vegetated after the water and sewer project had occurred. 
So I believe that, um, uh, see the issue though is to DEP, since there's an outstanding order of conditions that says that all these different areas needed to be um, restored is, well, since the city hasn't gotten a COC yet, um, you know, it still needs to be restored, which is a really difficult spot to be in because that water and sewer project now was so long ago. How are you going to figure out what was restored, what wasn't, who impacted it? I mean, it, it well, yeah, I mean, just, but, but the idea that the city used this and why uh, are, can't we or whatever the argument you just made, I don't quite buy that because uh, no homeowner is going to give their lot to a contractor without getting some kind of a compensation. Look, I don't know what the deal was um, with that. And my point in raising it in the NOI was not that, okay, the city used it, so we should be able to do a home. I think somebody said that to me. That's what I was trying to convey. Uh, wow. What's it the applicant? It was somebody, you know, somebody. Uh, well, why don't you clarify that? Because yeah. that's a big thing. I mean, if right. you're saying you're-, you're But my, right. So I, I can check with the owner as to whether, what happened with that use. but. Um, you know, th there are very few vacant lots, and my guess was the contractors are probably trying to take advantage of any vacant lots on Plum Island at the time. But my point in raising that was that, you know, it was within the context of it's been used for, you know, snow to be pushed on. It's been used, you know, for water and sewer. It's been used for this, been used for that. And it's just been impacted by different things over the years, and it doesn't really seem to have stopped for any length of time these ongoing impacts, whether it's neighbors, whether it's fishermen, whether it's the contractor next door, or whether, you know, whatever it is, it just seems to keep going with this lot. And that was kind of the point I was trying to make. Not that we deserve to be able to build because the city used the lot. That's not at no, all. No, it's just that you're, you're making a statement that the city used the lot and it's not really clear that the city used it. So I will, I will, you know, I was, that was what was conveyed to me and, and enough people sort of nodded you know, in, in my recollection that, um, well, that we included that, but I will, I will follow up with the landowner um, who I haven't really talked about this. I will ask him, you know, did they use it? If they did, you know, was there a legal arrangement or was it just, Hey, I'm not using that lot. If you want to use it, go ahead. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, it could be that the homeowner at the time didn't care or the property owner at the time didn't care if it was impacted or not. I mean, in, in on Plum okay. Island, it, you know, it was, still, it was a buildable lot. Maybe he was going to build on it. It didn't really matter. Yeah, yeah but I, it's taking I, you to the same place. It's taking you yeah. to an owner who's uh, yeah. utilizing a lot, and then it's turned into something that's not vegetated. All right. Well, let me let me find out what the story with that part is. I'll probably need to clarify that for my, my communications with DEP anyway. So I will, um, I'll try to get more information on that. My Again, my point in raising it to the commission was – more one to say what you know DEP seems to be just stuck on the water and sewer project part of it um, and and you know the fact that they the waiver and all this stuff and I mean you've seen it in the comments um, but the um, but my point in raising it was more just there's just been an ongoing impact from human disturbance on this lot uh, on this double lot um, so that that's kind of the main point that I'm trying to make there and that we have a we have a way that we think we can curtail that which will provide more reliable ongoing dune function um, honestly I don't know what the relevance is with the ongoing disturbance um, the pictures that I show the there are pictures from October of last year they are dated pictures showing uh, rather heavy vegetation there um, when it wasn't being impacted Right. We will, we will look at that. back rather rapidly. Right. So. We will, right. No, we, we will look at your, your materials and, and provide a response. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to, Tom, Tom I'm, I've got a question to, well, actually what, one is just to comment. Uh, I believe the, as part of the water sewer project, either the city or the contractor was supposed to go down every, every single uh, street and videotape. Uh, what that street looked like both before and after uh, the water and sewer project. 
So you, if, if those still exist, you might be able to find something there. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm uh, personally. Yeah, I'm, but, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not. In, yeah, I, I'm not interested in doing the COC though for the city on the water and sewer project. Right. right yeah. Now. But, and, but and, no, that that yeah. might be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody needed needed those pictures, but and but the other thing was, uh, you know, when you're reviewing uh, those documents that uh, Joe put together, uh, there was you know a lot of it was the the non-vegetated areas right now that should not be included in your count of what's right. going to be vegetated. Uh, if you could, as you're reviewing his documents, if you could um, keep a, you know, a, a running commentary on which pieces you agree with, or, and if there's pieces you don't agree with, why, you know, sure. so, so, so we can reach, some, you know, some, uh, some some point of agreement between all of us as to you know the the bottom line, right? I think we'll get a presentation. I think Paul, you make a really good point because there's a lot of um, you know it, it, we have a lot of aerials and there's a lot of um, yeah I don't want to call them accusations, but the things that have been put forward. So we're going to figure out a way that we can do a presentation um, which uses Joe's information as well as everything Tom has run the calculations, maybe it's right. a color-coded kind of plan or something like that, runs the calculations and, and be able to, to show you specifically um, so there's no, no confusion. Right. right. One, that one, That's excellent. One thing that would be really helpful in that, and Julia, I don't know if you know this or not, is it possible to get the actual raw images um, that you have in my map basically in their original geo reference thing so I, we can bring them into CAD and to ArcMap for that the- is, That is a question that's beyond my technological expertise. Right. Um, I could ask it, Diane. Um, it might have to be done through um, Merrimack Valley. Right, if I can get the 20 in the 2017, that would actually allow me to do better, you know, a better job of digitizing and especially the 2020, because then we could actually overlay construction impacts and give you- Can you put a very specific request in writing yep. to me an email and I can forward yep. it to Diane? We'll do well, it. I, Thank I, you. Think also, I think to help bolster that, um, the need for that information, you know, this is an issue that's been raised by the chair of the commission, right, on behalf of the city. Um, and it's a legitimate uh, calculation that needs to be run and it needs to be run accurately. So, um, Maybe that would be helpful in the argument to Merrimack Valley. Mm -hmm. Well, what, yeah. what I did to generate the overlays was I used um, ArcMap and I just uh, exported a picture from, uh, from MeMap and I geolocated it on the, uh, uh, the lot lines as shown on the uh, um, shown in the, the layer for the city's uh, lot lines. Right, so. and they're not, ac I mean, those are the problem. I, I get it, um, Joe, but th that's not accurate. Um, you know what I mean? It's not completely accurate. And oh, no, I know trying, it's not. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm, trying to get I'm it. To the, yeah, I'm just trying to get it so that it's as, as accurate as possible. Right, if we can get it so we can actually import it perfectly to scale geo-referenced into the plan with all our other layers, it allows us to do an awful lot more comparison and calculation and some better graphics to, to truly show you what additional impact the contractor had over the, the conditions at the site. Um, you know, and, and we'll take, a, we have to look through your whole presentation. There's an awful lot there to kind of digest in a, in a 15 minute presentation and, mm -hmm. and be able to incorporate it all. So, you know, we, uh, we will do that. You have anything else? Okay. When no. do you want to continue to? Um, the, the next meeting, I think. Yeah, that would be great. The 15th? Yeah. Motion to continue to uh, September 15th. Um, before we continue, to, oh. do we want no. to ask the public if they have any comments? All right. Uh, there is no public. They're all part of uh, this group. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure Eileen Graff is their architect. Yeah, Eileen's the architect. Okay, so there is no public. Second.
All right, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Jan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. <clears throat> Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, thank Mr. you very much. All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, just one quick thing. Uh, first yep. of all, thank you very much for the time. Uh, Steve, I learned that all of the trailers have been removed. Okay, good. Very good. All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Okay. The next item is John D. Filippo, New Report Yacht Club, 300 to 302 R. Merrimack Street, notice of intent. Okay. Is that yours, Tom? Yes, it is. So, good evening. Um, Tom Hughes with Hughes Environmental Consulting. Um, this NOI um, includes two different uh, kind of discrete projects. One is around the clubhouse and the other is the boat ramp. Um, and they're relatively minor, but you know what I'd like to do is walk you through it. First, while we've got this photo in front of you, um, you can see, just to orient you, um, this is sort of the what I'll call the main campus of the Yacht Club. You also have the Woodland Street lot that's in the upper left. You can kind of see that. Um, but the, uh, the swimming pool you'll notice is um, right next to the clubhouse. And, uh, and the NOI includes um, some renovations and maintenance to the clubhouse as well as um, uh, repairs to the pool area. Um, the other area you'll see is the boat ramp, which is down um, kind of to the right and towards the water there. And it also includes some maintenance to the boat ramp. So if we can go on to, um, I guess, yeah. So this, this is just the, that's the chapter 91 plan. And um, one of these days I need to get this fully clarified with DEP, but my understanding is because we have a chapter 91 plan that shows the historic um, mean high water line, which you can see there, which runs kind of through the center of the parking area on both, both sites, that everything seaward of that is filled tidelands. But if you look at where the state has since mapped the presumptive chapter 91 line, that's actually running along the shore. So we are gonna be sending these in as maintenance um, items to chapter 91. Although I, you know, if I was doing a new application and didn't have the, all this background, uh, information in the old files, the, um, the presumptive line would actually be much closer to the shore. And I think that may be shown on that aerial that is um, maybe 29 there, maybe not. Um, it, it, it's, so it's, it's kind of irrelevant, but so we also are in natural heritage, which is what the next uh, photo shows you. So the, the um, mainly the, uh, the boat ramp work would be in the, uh, in natural heritage. So if we can go down to the site photos, I think is probably best. Um, the area is zoned AE8. Okay, so here's the, the boat ramp to start with. Um, the plan for the boat ramp, and it would be the two left images are of the boat ramp area. Um, that, that one that is at the top is from the parking lot looking towards the boat ramp, and the other one is from the boat ramp looking up. You can see the paved surface of the boat ramp is in, um, you know, pretty rough shape there. The plan is during extreme low tide cycle, it would be um, skim coated with, uh, with a new paved surface. Um, and uh, my understanding is it basically is two runs over the boat ramp with the pavement and the, you know, and the, the rollers and all that and then they're done and that all can be done during one tide cycle in the dry. Uh, during that work and for at least one tide cycle after there would be an absorbent boom installed at the end of the ramp um, so that if we have any oils discharged from the fresh pavement, they're collected by the boom and the boom would be left in place until there's no longer any visible sheen leaving the, uh, the boat ramp, which should just be a couple tide cycles. Um, but we would just, you know, keep an eye on that before the boom is, is removed. Um, the next project, if you look at the um, picture in the center, you can see the handicap ramp on the, uh, on the clubhouse in front. And then you can see 
the uh, handicraft ramp in the bottom center. Um, as part of overall renovations, which are within the footprint of the um, clubhouse, where they're going to be relocating showers and trying to put a more publicly accessible handicap bathroom on one side of the, the clubhouse. Um, we need to rebuild the handicap ranch ramp, which is currently not to code. Um, so that is the only thing that really happens outside the footprint. I can show you on the site plans what that involves. There is also some utility work that will happen under the structure. The structure is currently elevated on piles. It has, um, it is located above the elevation of the floodplain. Um, it, it does have a very large utility chase structure. Um, I want to say it's like roughly like 15 by maybe 10 or something like that. That's going to be made a lot smaller as part of the process. Um, Britain Construction said that as they move the, um, the uh, showers around and all that, they're going to be consolidating those utilities into a smaller utility chase. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to be down to a plum island three and a half by three and a half, but it's certainly going to be smaller than what's there now. Um, part of that is going to depend on the actual location of some pipes under the structure as to how small they can make it, but it will definitely be a smaller solid obstruction. But again, it's above the floodplain. Um, and then if we look on the right hand side, you can see at the, on the top picture, you can see cracking concrete right next to the pool and you can see where it's really chipping off those light stains that are kind of right next to the stairs going down into the pool and then you can see the cracks in the concrete that has been you know painted over enough times with maintenance but it's still they're still coming through so the idea there would be to chip out the old deck and put in a new a new pool deck um, so if we can go now i think the next thing to look at would be the site plan which is uh, the second to last page okay so here you can see um, the boom is shown in yellow on the boat ramp on the bottom. Um, we have erosion control um, going from like around on the left hand side of the uh, area because any anything that drains from that ramp area and also from where the uh, pool is would be flowing towards a reef series from that, you know, over towards that side. So um, this kind of shows the uh, the the detail on that and you can see where the boat where the uh, handicap ramp has to incorporate an extra set of stairs and goes maybe a couple feet out there will be a um, a new planting bed put in there and there'll be some curbing put in there um, to protect the planting bed so there will be some sort of landscape shrubs put along the front of the clubhouse but it's really minor amount the entire impact area is mostly um, paved, some of it is, uh, is gravel. And the gravel area would be converted to a planting bed. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions the commission may have. And also this is in natural heritage, so we're gonna have to continue to the next meeting. I don't, it all seems pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, on its own, any one of these, except maybe the clubhouse work, um, would have been an RDA. But it seemed like we were doing all this together. It made sense to do the NOI. The, um, the, where the boat ramp is, uh, yep. am I looking at that red line? Is that, that's mean low water? Um, not sure what red line. Right at the lower part yeah right there. oh the yellow i'm oh. sorry. yellow line there is um is the boom the proposed boom um, okay. so the, the the um ramp is completely dry at an extreme low the paved surface so so um, mean low water is not it's just off? it's just off the ramp well, well low, lower low is just off the ramp Okay, I'm not seeing any of those lines. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm noticing that that is not shown and we can get you a plan with that shown. I'm going to need that for the Army Corps anyway. We, this will have to go, this will be an SVN with the Army Corps and maintenance with, um, with Chapter 91. So we'll make sure that we, we do uh, mean low or low before the next meeting. Um, and as far as the thickness of the pavement, 
Yeah, my understanding is just a, a, a couple inches. Just a, it's just a, a skim coat over. They're not grinding anything. They're not doing any kind of anything. They they say they can get it to adhere to the ramp and expect a like a five or year or greater uh, life expectancy. And the long term goal of the club, and they're trying to budget for it now, is to replace it down the road with the precast concrete ramps but right now they've got this paved ramp and they've just got to do something to maintain it and they don't have it in the budget to to do a bigger capital project right now okay okay anybody else okay there's still no public um what do we want to do there's no file number for this one yet either. So oh, we'll have okay. to continue. So yeah, we're going to be continuing anyways. Yeah, I have to continue to the 15th. So I guess if the commission doesn't have any other, more questions or anything, we will get you the uh, the low water line shown. I'll get you an updated plan. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd like to continue to the 15th. Your motion? Motion to continue to September 15th. Second. Okay, Paul Haley. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Wait, Tom. Oh, yep. Yeah. You want to um, check in on um, 1176 Street? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I. I meant to reach out to him today. It was just a very flurry day. The, the front fence was completely removed and he was moving on to work on the back fence, but I don't know the current status of that, but they were actively working on it and I can get you photos of the front fence removed. Um, I did send you a markup of a PDF. Did you get it? My email server yeah. is wonky this, the last two weeks. Yeah, one? so this is, so what, what we're looking at is every X, that would constitute a slap being removed. Um, and then the blue line would be that bottom horizontal piece moved up. And then you would put rabbit fencing across the, um, the bottom that's, you know, like 90 something percent open, 99% open, um, just to keep the dogs and kids in. Um, so- Yeah, it, I just wanted to make sure that the other fence was removed, it was supposed to be done by today. Um, yeah, I, again, I, it was just too crazy a day. I apologize. Yeah. I'll get you an update tomorrow right. on that. Okay. Um, but I know that he's been actively working on it. And what he did in the front left the post and he did just did these sort of, you'll see when I send it to you, it, it's like a, an X that, so it's gotta be 99% open now. Okay. Um, in between. Yeah, the, you can just send me okay. some photos of that ASAP right. just so we can make sure that it's moving. Yeah, we'll do. I will get that to you tomorrow and we'll give you a more comprehensive update at the next meeting. And uh, Everett Chandler has that slated if he hasn't done the field survey, which I, again, I meant to check in with him. Um, if it hasn't been done yet, it's going to have happened, um, you know, by the end of the week and we'll be uh, on track to get the notice of intent filed for, for everything for after the fact. Sounds good. Okay. Julie, you'll share those with us when you get them. Yep, I will send them to you as soon as I get them from Tom. Yeah, and I'll try to, I'll get an updated schedule from Everett and, and just give you that update in the same email as well. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay. All right, take care. You so. Um, well, let's uh, get a motion to close the public hearings now. Mm -hmm. so, Second. Uh, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, so we have one order conditions for yes. uh, Holly McDonald, 468th Street. Right. Yes. And so for 468th Street, I looks like there were three special conditions that were discussed. Um, the first was that 
Well, I put, I wrote this one in because you know how things go with lattice around foundations, but they have it shown on the plans and they agreed to there being no lattice or other enclosure below five feet, eight inches, which is the lowest horizontal member aside from the utility chase and the stairways and things like that. So I made a special condition that there shall be no lattice or siding around the open area below the building below um, the lowest horizontal members at five feet, eight inches. Um, and then there was another special condition that the existing Eastern red cedar is to be replaced or replanted on site. Um, and then mitigation planting areas as shown on plans and specified in the notice of intent shall be completed in the growing season immediately after completion of construction and monitored for survival for two years. And that's typical yeah. for what we do. And then I would put in all the other standard Palm Island things like sand, you know, no, no soils or mulches, only beach grade sand may be brought on site for planting, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. In a motion. Motion to issue the order conditions. Second. All right, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Ann Warshall. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Sender. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. And I say yes. All right. Um, do we have any new and or old business? Uh, I had um, a question a couple of meetings ago about the rail trail and where uh, National <laughs> Grid had the oh, stone yeah. put in that it, it doesn't look like they've done any additional planting. It looks like they just put a couple of shrubs in there and kind of walked away. Uh, yeah, Steve, I was supposed to follow up on that one and I haven't yet um, gotten in touch with them. So I'm going to make another note to um, send an email to the National Grid folks um, who permitted that and see if they can send us some photos and show us how they're going to finish the planting. Yeah, because what, what's out there is not what they described. So. No, you're, you're right. It's not. Um, so that's important. And they, you know, who knows when they would come in for a certificate on that. So I will get in touch with them. Dave, is that the sec? Where, where is that section of rail trail? Um, it's just before um, you get to the American Yacht Club. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's it's um, <coughs> a conduit or a culvert that goes under the the trail. Okay. And that the yeah okay that that does not directly abut the uh, the area I I continually confuse that area with the uh, area that's next to the uh, wastewater treatment plant. Oh, you're not so. far off. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. close. This is the area that, remember, they had um, it had gotten washed out and they put a whole bunch of um, crushed stone in there in this one yeah. area, huge area, it's like a, a, where there's a um, stormwater pipe that went underneath it. And they said so they couldn't figure out why it wouldn't hold the plantings. It kept getting washed out. So they filled it with crushed stone. And then we said, well, that's not really what you need to figure it out. So they came up with this proposal to sort of install plantings in and amongst the riprap um, as best they could. And they showed us photos of it. And the commission agreed, but it, it hasn't really been accomplished yet. Okay. Is that what you're talking about, David? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, when they were putting that in, I was always thinking about how they could, that area could be raised a couple of feet like they're going to want to do next to the wastewater treatment plant to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to serve as a, a berm. But uh, yeah. that isn't there. So never mm -hmm. mind. Um, Julia, have you been able to talk with Matt Kazaki yet? No. Oh, mowing because it's getting near time. It is getting near time. Um, yeah, I again, I was talking with Jordy about it, and we have not been able to reach him. Um, 
I don't really know what else to do, but um, we can send them a letter at ten to crop. Or... Yeah, maybe we can just send them <coughs> something in writing. Yeah, that's probably the best way to do it at this point. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and along that same line, we were going to talk sometime about a mowing and, and a plan for the land that we're getting from uh, Colby Farm Road. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we can do a Zoom meeting on that or. Okay, I'll talk to Jordy about that and Andy. Um, we have a, hmm, I don't know if we'll have a staff meeting. I think we have a staff meeting on Friday morning. So I'll put this on the list. I'll put both of these things on the list um, for that. So it's the Colby Farm, yeah. Maintenance. Right. Well, and, and. kind of laying out what we want to do with that all that land yeah yep yeah uh, yeah patrick seacamp did have his his planting plans and right yeah and we have a management plan for it we just need someone to be responsible for implementing the management plan and see were you also asking what's going to go on in the way back that yeah way back yeah. Lot? yeah i don't know um, i mean i'm of the opinion that you know there could be a trail there that connects to some of the other trails that we already have and um, yeah, it, it's it's difficult back there though. There's you'd be crossing the stream, so we'd need some sort of a bridge probably. Right. There's there's a lot of wet areas back there, and there's also somebody else's property. Right. Which they may be willing to give up. It's all wetland. That's true. Um, it, it's certainly worth. Uh, not. It's not usable. Is that a Colby that owns that? I, I um, can't remember. I don't remember. I think it is. But, yeah. And then, I don't know, Julia, you had said at one time that Tom and Lisa were going to give us an update on Evergreen Commons and what was going on out there. Yeah, we've got a site visit with them actually tomorrow on that um, because they would like to, you know, the thing came up with the pools. There's actually a whole lot of outstanding special conditions that they haven't met uh, for that subdivision yet. They've talked about wanting to come in and get certificates of compliance for the phase one and phase two homes. So tomorrow we're going out, I'm going out with um, the zoning um, administrator as well as I think John Eric is coming, I hope he is. Um, and to look at the whole site and the status of everything out there and have a discussion, so. My yeah. concern was that there were, I think there are three cellar holes that have not had yeah. anything done to them. Yeah. They're dug and nothing's happened. Oh, nothing's happening. They're just sitting there. Well, that's interesting because yeah. they usually they've been putting up these houses really fast. I know. Um, and they've been selling them really fast too. So that's surprising. I don't know what that would be, what the reasons for that would be, but there are definitely a, a lot of things that I'm actually glad that they're not done yet because I was worried that they were going so quickly that they'd be done and out, and all of a sudden we'd be left holding this subdivision with a bunch of you know, undone certificates of compliance and people living there and and conditions not met and stuff. So I'm glad that they're still out there on the job and the site isn't. Um, yeah, I, I could be wrong on the cellar holes, but I I drove by and they certainly looked like cellar holes. No, you're right. You're right. Their foundations are in. I've, I've seen the same thing. Um, last time I was out there, I think there were like five of them. So maybe they've built, in, built a couple since then. But um, yeah, I'll give you an update after tomorrow. Okay. When we go are, out there. are you going to be talking to them about pools there too? Yeah, well, the pools, they need to come in for a request with a request for an amendment for the pools, because as we discussed before, I think I, we would like to have, um, a, I want there to be a special condition in our orders of, of conditions that talks about um, the conditions under which a pool can be put on these lots so that it's specifically allowed but that it's only specifically allowed under certain provisions, like it can, you can't increase the impervious surface on any lot more than 5% and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and right now it, it's vague. Um, so we need to nail that down so that it, when the next time someone comes in with a pool permit, we have a way it, it, under which to look at that and review it and approve it um, moving forward. Because you know it's going to be the next 25 years. It's going to we're going to be dealing with what people want to do and not do out there. 
Um, so that's your next 25 years, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Just one other question popped into my mind. What's going on with the, the solar farm on uh, the dump? Uh, I'm not really in the loop on that so much anymore. I think it's moving forward. I think they've been having some meetings. I know there was recently a discussion with um, John Eric and the um, and their engineers about whether or not they needed to do any work on the, a culvert, the culvert that comes under the road um, from that the- That into the vernal pool? That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that culvert had been crushed and um, it needed to be fixed. And this goes back years. It has been fixed. It was replaced by New Ventures a long time ago. Um, and so that's in good condition now. And they they feel comfortable with that. And the and Blue Wave has agreed that if anything were to happen to it, that they would be responsible for, you know, they'd fix it. They want to make sure that the stormwater system continues to operate appropriately. But aside from that um, one conversation that was just had, I I really haven't been in the loop on the progress out there. Uh, so I can find out. I'll ask on Friday, get an update on that. Yes. So that's not within the 100 foot buffer? No, like, all the work, well, that the pipe is, but that's not part of this project. So the, the solar panels, that they're putting up on top of the landfill are all outside of the 100 foot buffer. We looked at this like a year ago um, and reviewed it and they're entirely outside of the buffer zone up there. So, and they've confirmed, they confirmed with us that all the work that they're doing, including any facilities and surrounding sort of like infrastructure is all outside of the buffer zone. So um, it's upland. So that was our, the extent of our involvement. And we did try while they're forming an agreement with the city and with DEP to, to do this solar project, we did try to get them to go back and um, get movement on the vernal pool issue. Um, and it wasn't something that DEP wanted to put oh, in. Yeah, they don't care about that. Yeah, we got blown off on that um, by all parties, so. Yeah, It'd be nice to go in there and check again to see if anything is uh, is using it again. It, it's probably not as disgusting as it was uh, 15 years ago, but- uh, Yeah, I mean, it's aside from the Phragmites, I mean, I think it's pretty okay in there. Um, yeah, I heard wood frogs in there this spring, so. Oh, you did, okay, so. Yeah, when when I certified it, I was in up to my hips with, uh, with barrels and, and other garbage a lot of other garbage in there yeah, yeah luckily they did do some they started enough of the work that they got a lot of it cleaned up they just never completed the invasives removal yeah piece. yeah the only the concern hardest. would be the frag taking over all of it yeah that's the hardest piece but where's this property so this is at the landfill at oh, the end of crow lane it's where it's, they're going to put a solar project up there now thank you yeah. Interesting. And, and the vernal pool is directly next to the red recycling barn. Directly right next to it. Yes, <laughs> directly. Okay, well. Anything new anything? on the um, Zoom versus uh, hybrid versus uh, in-person meetings and so forth? Um, so far, uh, the city council is not pushing for boards and commissions to do what they would like to do, which is go back to a more in-person thing. They're kind of leaving boards and commissions out of it right now, which is great. And actually I'm not really even sure that they have the authority to tell the boards and commissions what to do. Um, but that's why I asked you all for your opinion at the last meeting. And if it comes up again, so for, for now, things are just going to stay this way. Um, but you know, if you have any concerns one way or another, just let me know. And if anything comes up um, from the city side, like if the mayor says she wants us all to go back in person, I will let you know ASAP, um, you know, so that it can be discussed. But so far, that hasn't been, I haven't heard anything about it. Yeah, I would prefer this so when I piss off applicants, they can't come and punch me in the face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Um, Julia, maybe you could bring up at your staff meeting, well, I, I really would like to, to be able to see the, the people who are talking. Okay. Um, I did tell Andy that after, we, after the last meeting when you guys said that, I, I told him that that's how you all felt. And um, he said that we could talk about ways to make that happen. He does not want to um, open up video channels for all of the attendees. But mm -hmm. I think that it makes sense to open up the video for the presenters on any given agenda item. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm certainly fine with that. Okay. Why don't you know if you could, any of these thoughts that you have, if you could, because, you know, I'm just sort of conveying to Andy what we're talking about. I mean, if you could send me an email expressing that, then it's just better. It's something that I can forward to Andy in writing from, from you guys. It might have a more of an impact in in him sort of saying okay and because he has to change the controls on the zoom meeting in order for us to do it um so i just want to make sure that everyone you know is on the same page and that andy gets why you would like to change it and then we can hopefully make it happen yeah because really it would only be a, a maximum of maybe three people Three other people. Yeah, three at a time. And we and Andy and I also discussed that we don't necessarily want to allow everybody to share their screen, allow the presenters to share their screen. For now, it's better if we're in charge of sharing the screen. Um, but at least we sh we should be able to see their faces. So um, yeah, anyway, and, if you and, could send me emails about that, that'd be great. The reality is their information should be in with you prior to the meeting yeah. and then, you know, they don't need to share screens. They, right. they, can, they can ask right. where, you know, tell you where to point. And right. So far, work. this has been the smoothest way to do it. I think it makes a lot of sense to keep doing it like right. with just us sharing the screen. Uh -huh. All right, anything else? Yeah, um, I know it's late, but can you, this is my ignorance, can we talk for a minute about what enforcement authority we have? I, we brought up uh, that topic a couple times in the last meeting and this meeting. Uh, is our authority just to compel people to undo what they do? Is, is there, do we have more authority uh, than that? Um, well, that's a good question. That, so, if there's a violation of the Wetlands Protection Act or of our ordinance that we see, or you know, if anyone sees or we're, we're made aware of by a neighbor or a butter or whatever, um, then we have the authority. Typically, how it works is what there's an enforcement order under the Wetlands Protection Act. It's an official form. It's a legal enforcement order that um, they are required to comply with, or and if they don't comply with the um, requests in the enforcement order, which would be things like immediately stop work, um, return site to existing condition, whatever it might be, depending on the nature of the violation. Um, if they don't comply with that enforcement order, technically the commission is allowed to issue fines and the fines can be issued up to $300 per day per violation. And that's like any violation of provisions of the Wetlands Protection Act on that site can be considered a, an individual violation. And each day that the violation is occurring is a separate violation. So the fines can add up pretty quickly for somebody. We've never fined anybody. We have, we've gotten to the point where we have um, made it clear that if something doesn't happen by a certain date that they will be fined. And that in, in every case so far, that has resulted in compliance with the enforcement order. Um, but typically if we see something going on um, anywhere, you know, let's say some, it, so you get a, a neighbor who sends photographs of somebody taking down a bunch of trees in the wetland behind their house or dumping something into the salt marsh or whatever it might be, um, excavating some, you know, the, the vernal pool or whatever. Um, we would issue if it's sort of circumstantial evidence, we would issue or send them what's called a, a notice of violation, which basically is a letter and a sort of a, a form letter that states, um, it has come to the commission's attention that there may be a violation of the Wellness Protection Act 
or this or the Newburyport Wetlands Protection Ordinance on your property, the nature of the um, suspected violation is X, Y, or Z. Um, please attend the next Conservation Commission meeting on X date to um, discuss this with the commission. Um, that's kind of how it goes. And we send that by certified mail. And most of the time, the, the homeowner will come in. Um, they'll call, they'll email right away. They'll say, oh my gosh, I didn't know what happened. And they'll come in, they'll fix it. And we'll work with them through that without ever even having to necessarily issue the actual enforcement order. But once that enforcement order does get issued, that's a, that's a legally binding um, order that they have to comply with. That makes sense? Great, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Motion to adjourn. Second. Paul Haley. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshall. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Jane Zender. Yes. Rhonda Cola. Yes. And I vote yes. <clears throat> so, all right, folks. All right. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.